welcome to our Lunch and Lead. Uh, we feel really fortunate today to have uh, a civic leader from our region who's going to share some of his leadership journey with, with us. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Victor Garcia in just a moment. Um, our goal today is to have a, a conversational chat about leadership during challenging times. Uh, we'd like to do this sort of in an informal way. And so the chat will be a place where you can put your questions, your comments, and um, we will get to those later in the session. So um, you are all leadership practitioners in some uh, way or, or form, or either an organization or a nonprofit or a business. And so what we're looking to Victor today for is to get, have to share a little bit about his leadership journey, his the wisdom that he's gained over the years, and any tips or ideas that might be helpful to those of us who uh, are leadership pr practitioners, we're the boots on the ground leaders in the region. And um, you know, during this time, this challenging time, leadership has really been tested in a way that is uh, unique to the last uh, to the last year. And so, while some people have um, have found it very difficult, other leaders have been innovator innovative leaders, and they've really thrived. So, we're going to listen a little bit to um, Victor's story about food insecurity and the challenges that his organization has had to step up and face as many families across our region, like all across uh, America, have had trouble with, um, with jobs and with uh, children being home and eating more and, um, and all the challenges of, of, uh, of making sure we have food on the table for our, for our families. So um, Victor will talk about 15 or 20 minutes, a little bit about his leadership journey. And then we have some questions that we may ask him, but I'm also looking for uh, you to throw questions into the chat so that we can really um, provide the insight that you may need um, from your particular perspective that um, Victor may be able to share with us. So um, a little bit about Victor, I'm sure he'll tell us a lot about himself but I always think it's nice to um, tell you the things he might not want to um, brag about. So he's the president and CEO of the Food Bank of Northwest Indiana, and his organization provides food assistance for 600,000, over 600,000 people. I think it's like 660,000 people, uh, families and residents and children in Northwest Indiana, and that's pretty amazing. They provide food for Lake and Porter counties. Prior to his appointment at the food bank, and he has not been there uh, a really long time. And before we started, I was chatting with him that they are really fortunate to have him during such a challenging time because he brings not only a community spirit, uh, he brings a lot of expertise uh, with him to the position. Uh, he previously was an executive leader at the um, Mental Health America of Northwest Indiana and also served as the Northwest Division Director for the Indiana Chapter of the March of Dimes. So he's had a, a deep uh, experience in the nonprofit sector. He's also a community leader, which um, Victor and I like to, have always liked to chat about. He uh, has served as an advisory board member for the Leadership Institute, which is hosting our call today. And he's current vice president of the school town of Highlands Board of Trustees. So he ran for election, which is, as I always share, it's a bold and brave move. Um, Victor, it was his first time, I believe, running for school board. And um, not only did he win, but he's the vice president of the school board in Highlands. So that's a, quite an accomplishment. And amidst all the other things he does, he's a busy family man. He and his wife, Monica, live in Highland, and they have two children and uh, some lovely, lovely dogs. He's got three, three pups. He's a, a certified fundraising executive. He has a bachelor's of science in organizational leadership from Indiana Institute of Technology and a master's of science in strategic management from Indiana Wesleyan. So not only is he, is he talented, but he's experienced, and he also has just a, a really great giving spirit. So Victor, I'm going to turn it over to you. If anyone has questions or things they want Victor to follow up on, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Jason is here, Jason Williams from the Society of Innovators and the Leadership Institute will be helping host. Uh, Rachel Smith is our academic director, Rachel, Dr. Rachel, and Dr. Jane Thomas is our assistant uh, academic director and she's here with us. So we're really glad that you're here and uh, Victor, take it away. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Sheila. And uh, thank you all of you for taking time to uh, sit in and listen to my ramblings. Um, it, uh, Sheila made me sound better than I am. I am certainly no Dr. Rachel. Um, that is the expert in leadership in, in my world. Uh, but what I wanted to share today was a little bit of uh, what my leadership style is and uh, some examples of how I implement it. But I did want to give a little bit of background on the Food Bank of Northwest Indiana to kind of give you um, a scene setting for uh, what 2020 was like um, in terms of leadership here. So 
Um, the food bank moved to our new facility at 6490 Broadway in 2018 uh, from what many of you may know, uh, the barn in Gary. Uh, so we went from about a 15 to 18,000 square foot facility to 72,000 square feet, which was very beneficial from a leadership standpoint because it allowed us an opportunity to uh, pivot and change programming as we responded to COVID. Um, now, having said that, uh, a record year at the food bank uh, in 2019 was distributing 9 million pounds of food. Um, excuse me, I misspoke. Uh, 6 million pounds of food. Uh, in 2020, we distributed over 10 million pounds of food, which equates to about 9 million meals. Um, so we experienced immense growth uh, as we responded to COVID-19. Uh, additionally, we, we had to grow uh, with uh, staff. So we had some unique uh, leadership challenges um, and some unique strategic challenges in that um, the bulk of our human resources is volunteers. And when we were shut down, we had to close down our, our buildings to volunteers, uh, which meant we had to rely more on our staff. Um, and then we had a really unique situation that happened in, um, in April and that was the deployment of the National Guard to our facility. So we had around 30 National Guard members work with us most of 2020. So now we had a, a challenge in that we didn't have our volunteers. Uh, we had our staff, but we're a nonprofit. So of course we're lean. And then we had all of these soldiers uh, reporting uh, to our food bank. So it required um, a lot of Oh, uh, flexibility, I guess, is the best word, not just from our leadership team, but from our staff as well, and having to shift how we interact with each other, um, keeping social distancing, wearing masks, uh, the work that needs to be done. But then also, how do we shift our programming? Um, so that's kind of setting the stage for what 2020 looked like at the food bank. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the programming because that's not really the purpose of this conversation. We're looking more at... Um, what leadership looks like, and in particular, um, what I adhere to in values-based leadership. So what I want to share today is um, seven principles that I've either picked up throughout my academic career or my uh, professional career, and just share some of those principles and some concepts behind them, and then how I implement those um, as a leader in my organization. Um, so if uh, if we're okay with that, uh, please drop any questions or comments in the uh, chat box and we'll get back to those. And I'm happy to discuss in further detail uh, any of these items. So going back to the seven principles of values-based leadership that, again, there are a lot more and, and Dr. Rachel can go into deeper, deeper uh, depth into uh, principles of, of leadership. But these are the ones that kind of resonated for me. So the first one being the old adage of just respect other people. This isn't very hard, right? So be respectful of other people and more importantly, be respectful of their time. So one of the ways that uh, I implement this is really by um, acknowledging and affirming dignity for others, especially in all levels in the, of the organization. Um, I find that sometimes leaders look at either a title or a pay range and may treat uh, individuals uh, uh, differently than they would others in their organization. I find it's very important to respect everyone um, and treat them the way you want to be treated, right? And it's easy to say that, um, but sometimes we find it, it to be a little more difficult to spend the amount of time uh, with maybe uh, individuals who uh, are a little more um, doing the uh, hourly work or uh, what in most worlds are going to classify as, you know, this isn't as a high level position. Um, those people are just as critical to your operations as everybody in the C-suite is, right? So uh, I'll give you an example. So here at the food bank, uh, we get audited by the USDA, by Feeding America, by AIB. And part of that audit is our cleanliness. So the, the effort that our custodial team puts together is just as critical to our success as our development team or our program team or our leadership team. Um, so sometimes when you're looking at some of those positions, um, it's really making sure you're respecting and so, you know talking to these people and getting down to who they are. And we're gonna get into some of that in a little bit. But there's one other piece in respecting others and time that we often overlook. 
and that is resolving issues immediately. Um, so there's going to be times in your leadership journey where um, you're going to be tasked with having to make a, a difficult decision uh, in terms of a human resource position or corrective action. You can't wait for those types of things to fix themselves. Um, you have to address them immediately. And, and I know some of the uh, old school books like One Minute Manager have kind of fallen out of favor. Um, but it, one of the things I really like about the One Minute Manager concept was really just getting to the root cause of the issue and taking the emotion and the um, uh, feelings you have for the person as an individual out of those challenging conversations and really just saying, look, I like you as a person, but we have an issue here and we need to look at your productivity. Um, that only works though if you're following these other pieces of that value-based leadership. So value-based leadership principle number two, inspire vision. The best way to do this, in my opinion, is to instill passion in your team. If you're not passionate about your work, your team is going to see that and feel it. And you have to instill that passion with every um, every interaction with you, that you have with the team that you're leading and um, with your external partners. One way to do that also is really to explain the why behind the task that's being uh, delegated uh, or why uh, we're going a direction that we're going. It's really easy to get focused on the who, what, when, where. Um, but if your team doesn't really understand why we're going in the direction we're going, uh, there's going to be a bigger challenge for that buy-in. Um, and really, people want to know what their particular role is in the work that you're doing and how that contributes to the larger picture of the organization and what are, we're trying to accomplish. So really inspiring that vision and modeling the way for the team, right? So it's not just talking to talk, but walking to walk, right? These are all old cliches that we've all heard, um, but it's really easy to forget to do those things, right? Um, so one thing I make sure that I focus on is being sure to not ask somebody to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. Now, that doesn't mean that that's my job, uh, but if I'm going to ask somebody to do a task, I better be willing to do it myself. Otherwise, I need to look back at, are, should we be doing this task? Is this the right thing? Is that the right person to be doing that task? Um, and it gives you an opportunity to really look at it from all levels. And the third principle being choose ethics over profits. And I can't stress this enough. I find many leaders um, forget that piece and look at um, either a bonus structure or they look at the financial health of the organization, or much worse, their own personal financial health. Um, and that, that puts themselves and their organization in, in a very challenging position. Um, so I wanna bring up two things. One is you really have to define where that line is in your own personal and your organizational's integrity. Um, there is one thing that you cannot, um, cannot risk in our community, and that's your own and your company's brands, your own personal brand and your company's brands. And that is uh, based in where your integrity lies and where you draw the line in the sand. Listen, the world is not black and white, it is gray, but at some point you have to decide where is this uh, line going to be drawn that I'm not willing to go past. And not just you as an individual, but your organization as well. Um, I can speak to, from a nonprofit standpoint, uh, a lot of our funding is grant funded, right? Um, so sometimes if you're not really paying attention to your, your line items, um, it gets really easy to double dip, um, to uh, try and claim a programmatic success for multiple things. Um, you can't do that. You have to define your integrity, stick to it, um, not just from an organizational level, but also from a personal level. Um, that personal brand, I, I really do believe is what will get you into that next level and really is going to build that relationship with your team as well. When you're, uh, saying who you are and you follow through with those things, um, it really helps in the development of your staff, um, and getting people to buy in and, and that vision piece that we already discussed. And the fourth one is empower others. Um, I, I personally meet with uh, every single one of my teammates uh, when I'm either a new staff person and, and I've got a team reporting to me or uh, now as we grow, um, 
And uh, I see Ann is on, on the call here. And I'm going to call Ann out because we uh, we just I just signed her offer letter uh, right before uh, getting on this call. Ann's going to be joining the food bank here shortly. Um, but within the first two weeks of uh, new staff joining the food bank, uh, I schedule a one on one with those staff members. And the purpose of that one on one is not to go over organizational policies, procedures, uh, anything about the organization, it is a 30 to 60 minute conversation just to get to know each other. So I truly believe that my role as a leader is to make other good leaders in my organization and in my community. And I can't do that if I don't know what skill sets they need for their toolbox, how I can help them, what their career goals are. I am absolutely okay with my team moving on to do something else in their career if uh, what their personal goals aren't going to be met at the food bank. It is absolutely part of my job to help them through that process. Um, so I meet with everyone to get them to, to get to know them personally, but more importantly to learn what is it that they wanna do three, five, seven, ten 10 years from now, and how can I help them get there? Um, hopefully that's within our organization, but if it's not, that's okay. I wanna help them get to, to that process uh, with another organization as well. Empowering others also means though that um, inspiring ownership in their work and delegating that work and explaining why they're the right person for, uh, for that particular task. Um, which also means you kind of have to allow for some risk for failure and mistakes because that helps in development, right? So oftentimes as leaders, we want to, um, we're oftentimes type A personalities and want to take ownership of everything that's going on and micromanage things. And it's really important, I believe, we take a step back and say, these are the expectations, these are the tools, let me know what help you have, but I really want to empower my team to get the job done and feel that they can do it um, and make decisions on their own. I also have to know that it's going to be okay for them to make a, uh, a mistake or an incorrect decision because we can learn from that. It also might create new opportunities that we didn't anticipate or weren't looking for. So um, I often tell people making a mistake isn't isn't a bad thing. Making mistakes just fine. We just have to learn from it and grow from it. And that's the key. Also, when we make a mistake, we have to own it and apologize. So usually in our world in nonprofit, our mistakes are often made that, uh, with our, our partners, usually our funding partners. Um, and that's okay. We just have to say, hey, I'm sorry own it and fix it. The fifth piece in um, the principles that I follow is appreciating people. Um, and that's tangible appreciation, whether that's um, internal partners or external partners, um, but really having that, um, that thank you. Everybody wants to feel appreciated. They might not tell you that, um, but one of the ways I'm able to, to glean this is um, during my one-on-one -on -one sessions, I will often ask how my staff likes to be recognized. I can't assume how people want to be recognized. Some people don't like um, big recognition pieces in the newspaper or in front of their teammates. Some people just want that quiet thank you. Some pe people like a thank you with the simple act of buying them a donut once in a while, right? That's okay. Um, but you don't know that and you can't assume that you know that about your team. Um, so really getting down to getting to know your staff. Um, the people you're working with, and then how they like to be appreciated. Um, but also, it's really just putting your people first. Um, and this is going to kind of dovetail into one of the other principles um, that I'm going to end with. Um, but really put your people first and what their needs are. Um, as we've been dealing with COVID-19 and our response, uh, that has been the forefront of our decision-making process is how is our shift in program delivery, how is our shift in our operations, not only gonna impact the uh, partners that we have externally and our end user, but how is it going to impact our team? Um, I uh, built and hope that we're building a culture here at the food bank where we are customer, uh, customer service cent centered. Um, customer service centered meaning um, our, our teammates, are our customers, our end users are our customers, our financial partners are our customers, our programmatic partners are our customers. So really making sure that we're taking care of each other, looking at, um, at our organization that we're building a culture of care and that we care about each other. Um, and that only happens uh, if leadership is, uh, is showing that example of a culture of care. 
The sixth principle um, that I follow is balancing focus with flexibility. Um, we would not have been able to do the work that we've done in 2020 if we were not nimble and able to pivot um, in our efforts. Uh, it has been a wild ride for most everybody on this call, right? Um, but I can tell you from a food bank perspective, um, this has been the most challenging and rewarding year of my career. Um, one unique thing about the food bank is um, our work is really rooted in what amounts to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So food, safety, and shelter are critical. You can't focus on anything else until those three things are met. Um, but the challenge that we see is what um, Dr. Fauci mentioned this morning is we're likely to get to a more comfortable place with, uh, with the pandemic by um, the end of summer, hopefully, uh, um, if not in the uh, fall. Um, but we're not going to experience that at the food bank because our crisis is more on the economic impact COVID has had in our region. As more and more people are without um, jobs or limited pay, limited hours. Um, listen, if you were working an hourly job and even just those two, three months of a shutdown, it's going to take years to replace that income. Um, so we're going to continue to experience this increase in demand for charitable food in our community for probably two to five years. Um, so we're going to be in what is quote unquote pandemic mode uh, for our, our demand of services for quite some time. And what that means in balancing focus and flexibility is we still need to focus on, and Deb uh, and I were just talking as we were getting started on, uh, what our strategic plan was and focusing on that, but also being flexible and understanding um, there might need to be a shift to what we thought the organization needed to do because of these new demands uh, on us. And I really think it's important that no matter what organization that you're in, that you really focus on market trends and be proactive on what you think is going to happen and how you respond to that uh, before it gets to a point that you're forced to respond to it. So I'll give you an example. Early on in the pandemic, uh, we didn't know what was happening, but all we did know was person-to-person -person contact was going to be dangerous. We shifted our mobile market distributions to drive-through service uh, within about seven days of making that decision, we had to put together the logistics, the processes, how are we going to do this? So we're able to stay focused on what the organizational and end user needs were going to be, but also we had to be flexible and figure out how are we going to do this in a new way. Um, additionally, we saw such an increase in demand for services, which also meant we needed to increase our inventory levels, which also meant we needed to increase our financial resources. So it wasn't just the, the programmatic shifts that we had to do, we had to really shift how we do business, which included um, implementing and investing in new systems. Um, we were, uh, I'm, I'll be honest, we're a small group, we're all friends here, I can share. It's not like uh, Sheila's gonna post this on YouTube or something, right, Sheila? Um, so <laughs> I joke there. Um, so we really had to focus on we we had systems that were a little archaic. It was a lot a lot of manual data entry uh, because we were for the most part we we're a small mom pop nonprofit. We're not that organization anymore, and so we had to invest in ways that we could uh, get more efficient so that we can be better at the work that we're doing and serving our community in, in a more meaningful way. So it's a way of saying, as a leader, it's really important that you maintain that ten thousand foot view while also keeping track on that boots on the ground work. One of the ways I personally do that is checking in with my team. Um, I try to do it daily, I'm not gonna lie, I don't get to do it every day, but doing that daily check-in in the morning, afternoon, at the end of the day, whatever it is, but just walking through your facility and checking in with everyone to see how they're doing. Um, it doesn't have to be a where are we at with uh, Project XYZ? It could just be, how are you feeling today? How, how are you working? What support do you need? What can I do to help you today? Um, that, that piece is so critical. And we're getting close to the end. I probably, Sheila, I apologize. I'm getting a little tight on my 15 to 20 minutes. Um, but this last piece, um, I keep do talking. believe- You're doing great, Victor. <laughs> this is so interesting. Great, thanks, Sheila. 
Um, the last piece on the values-based leadership principles that I personally try to implement is really serving with humility. Um, so oftentimes we hear about servant leadership, um, values-based leadership kind of gets intermingled with it. They're a little bit different, I believe. Dr. Rachel can probably give you a little bit more of that information. Um, it's also a little bit of, you know, relationship-based leadership, right? So it's kind of intertwining all these different um, academic schools of thoughts. Uh, but that piece of humility is, in my opinion, maybe the most critical. Um, and one of those things is being recognize your own areas for improvement. We are all human. Every single one of us, none of us are perfect. So identifying what are those things that I need to be better in, um, what can I improve on? And the only way to do that is by, to be a lifelong learner. Um, so improve your knowledge in something every day. And I'll give you an example of how uh, one thing I do. Um, every morning, my drive into work is listening to uh, Lakeshore uh, Media, so Lakeshore FM, um, to learn more about what's happening in the country, outside the country, but also what's happening in my community. Um, it's a great way to take my commute time and, um, and leverage it to learn something because the great thing in the morning, I'm getting a lot of like, this is what happened yesterday. Um, but the evening commute for Lakeshore Radio uh, gives you, I don't know if you anybody listens to NPR, but All Things Considered is such a great show because they'll give you little tidbits about something maybe you didn't know. Um, and those things are great as you're building relationships with individuals, because the more you learn about something new to you, you'll be able to find a commonality as you're interacting with other individuals in our community, whether that's staff uh, that report to you or just people that you meet at the uh, family barbecue. The other thing with serving with humility is to own the mistakes, whether they're your mistakes or not. So when something goes wrong, own that piece. But when something goes right, give the credit to that success to your team. Don't take that credit. It's easy to say, oh, I did this, but you really didn't. Your team did this, and you have to give them credit for those things, and your team will respond to that. So when you're giving credit to what um, the good things are and giving that credit over to your team, but owning the mistakes and not highlighting if that mistake may have been on someone else. You can highlight that on your one-on-one -on -one in your team meetings. You can still focus and hold people accountable, but you don't need to do that in a public setting. In a public setting, you drop the ball, your team hit the home runs. Um, and in, in my opinion, that is the best way uh, to serve with humility. Now, my, my call to action for each of you, as all of you here on this call are leaders in your own right, my call to action to you is to learn from other leaders. Um, every, uh, every leader that you've interacted with, whether that was a boss or uh, a leader that had charismatic authority, whatever it might be, you have something to learn from them. That can be something that you want to mirror as, uh, as a leader in your own right. It can also be something that you don't want to mirror and is a, a problem. And I can tell you, I, we can probably all think of a boss that um, maybe exhibited some traits that we weren't a big fan of. Um, so don't do those things, right? Learn from that and don't do those. Conversely, we all have that boss that we loved, right? Or that leader that we loved. Uh, learn from them. Um, and I wanna focus, uh, oftentimes uh, we talk about um, looking at leadership books and looking at the academic side of this. But there's leaders in your day-to-day -day life, right? They don't have to necessarily have some sort of official fancy pants leadership title to be a leader. There are those charismatic leaders in our communities. Um, you know who they are, right? Whether that's the individual uh, parent in, uh, in the PTO uh, who just shows up and kind of takes over things, even though they're not the PTO president. Those are leaders. So like pay attention to those individuals too and glean what you can and learn from them on how they interact uh, with the people that they are leading as well. Um, in terms of today's talk, that is really uh, what I wanted to kind of hone in on. Um, I suspect I didn't tell you anything you didn't already know. I'm looking at, you know, someone like uh, Jen Casenza, who I've been working with for quite a long time. Um, 
I know I didn't tell her anything new, right? But sometimes it's important to see how other leaders implement these skill sets into their day-to-day -day work. Um, so I'm going to pause there and turn it back to Sheila and um, give an opportunity to, to either uh, dig a little deeper in any of these seven principles um, or share a little deeper on how I implement these uh, with my team at the food bank. Um, I, I'm also willing to kind of share how some of these skill sets can be implemented from a, an elected official standpoint. Um, this has been a challenging year in my career. As I mentioned, a, a very rewarding year, but not only did I have um, all of these challenges with my food bank hat on, uh, but then I would go home after uh, working with the food bank and put on my school board hat on. And I'll be honest with you, that has been probably a, a bigger challenge uh, than my actual day job was because of the passion our parents and teachers have and their rightful concerns in what, how do we educate our students. So, um, so I'll leave it there, Sheila, I'll let you take it. Thank you, Victor. Uh, great, great talk. And while some of this may be may not be new information, it's really important, especially as we start out. It's January. It's a new year. It's we're we're we've all we're survivors of a really really tough year. Uh, most of us personally and professionally, it, it's been a year of. Um, uh, disruption, let's put it that way. And so uh, really good to have this positive messaging uh, from you, Victor. You're very, you're very charismatic and you're also very practical, which I think is really helpful. Uh, when you were talking about a few things, um, I, I, I think I've shared with you that my dad was a real great um, leader in my in my personal life and trainer. And he he the idea you talk about is being on the floor, trying to find time to to he used to call that management by walking around. And um, he would just he, it wasn't that he was checking on people, and they knew that he wasn't there to like do any gotchas. He was there to get to know them, build relationships, because then when the push came to shove, those relationships would help him be a better leader. So th thank you for that really good reminder. Uh, a lot of people thanking you in the in the chat and saying that, you know, it was really inspiring. And um, uh, Andreas asked about volunteers. Uh, how do we volunteer at the food bank? And has the um, pandemic created a need for more volunteers? And how, how are you working through that? even with social distancing, which apparently we're in the orange now and social distancing is gonna to start to ease up a tad as we get more people vaccinated. Sure, um, so thank you for, for that question. Um, as I mentioned, uh, volunteers are the backbone of the food bank. Um, we have, we've expanded greatly. We have about 25, 26 employees um, as we start 2021. Uh, but in a normal year at the food bank, we have around 4,000 volunteers. Um, so that gives you an idea of how important volunteers are to our success. Um, so we, one of those process improvements that we identified is how do we connect with volunteers in an easier and more meaningful way? And we launched something new this year. So if you go to foodbanknwi.org slash volunteer, um, there is a, what we, it's a sign up genius is the software, but it's a great way we post every day what the volunteer opportunities are and how many slots there are. And it's so easy. We used to have to call people or email people or communicate one on one. Now we have everything automated. It lets you know what the job is, uh, what to expect. Um, and if you need to cancel, you're able to do that as well. And it frees up that spot again so that we're not managing that process as well. Now, here's what you can expect, consistent volunteer needs. Um, we have consistent volunteer needs in packing uh, food, uh, packing boxes here at the warehouse. That's usually a nine to 12 shift Monday through Friday. Uh, we uh, have Saturday shifts in our own mobile market distributions here um, at the warehouse in Maryville. Um, that is again, all outdoors. So those volunteers, we expect them to come prepared to work outside. We're gonna serve anywhere between four to 600 households every week on our distribution here. And to give you an idea, our mobile market distributions in 2019, we did two a week. We currently, uh, and for all of 2020, we do six a week. Uh, so one a once a week we're here on site and then five days a week we're somewhere off site. So there are some opportunities off site as well. We also need volunteer drivers um, to deliver a product to homebound seniors. Um, and that's just getting a list of maybe five to 10 houses. You pick up boxes and go drop them off at a, a doorstep. Um, everything we're doing is keeping social distancing requirements um, and mask requirements in place. Um, and those are just some of, of a few examples. We're also going to need, um, we, we have some drywall needs. I need some volunteers who know how to hang drywall and get that kind of stuff up. So we have some facilities. We also have 
Uh, for those who want to volunteer but don't want to come into the building, uh, we have phone calls that need to be made, whether that's on the advocacy side or thank you, thanking our donors. Uh, so there's volunteer opportunities that you can do from home as well. Uh, but foodbanknwi.org slash volunteer. And since we're kind of on that programmatic side, I will also say um, we're also trying to eliminate that stigmatization of needing food supports. Um, we've had a lot of friends and neighbors in Northwest Indiana that found themselves needing charitable food for the first time. That's okay, right? So um, it's okay to need help, whether that's you personally or someone you know. Um, but I wanted to share this. If you text Food Bank NWI to the number 50155, that'll send you a text message every day of where our mobile market distribution will be. So if you know somebody who needs a little bit of help, just have them text that. They don't have to feel embarrassed by calling in, asking for questions. They'll just get a text message. This is where we're going to be at this time, and this is the location. They're not going to get a, a donation request. They're not going to get anything else. They're just going to learn where the mobile market distribution is. They just show up, stay in their car, very little um, interaction with anybody, um, and that's the way they can get groceries. Thank you, Victor. Um, can you clarify the number people are asking? They missed that number. So what is the, t the text message? Yes, it's yes. Food Bank NWI to the number 50155. And I see David put that in there. It is 50155. That is correct. Great. Thanks so much. That's really helpful. You know, that that goes along with one of your one of your principles was about being respectful. And so know, knowing that there is um, in our country a little bit of shame associated with needing needing support from from other entities uh, when your times are tough. Um, that's really that goes back to that principle of respect for for others, making sure that your staff feels that respect. And then they're also uh, giving that respect to the recipients. That's really important. So you know, Sheila, I do want to add in just kind of yeah. um, adding into that customer service centric focus. Um, we instill in our team and our volunteers um, that you smile when you're dealing with our clients. Um, even if you're wearing a mask, you can see it in the eyes. But it's that idea of, of saying, look, I'm glad you came out today. I am so happy you came to visit the pantry or our mobile market or that you enrolled in our senior box program or commodity supplemental food program. Because honestly, that is our role here and that's okay. There should be no shame here. And that's part of our breaking of stigmatization, but goes back to that customer service focus um, that I think is important as we build a culture. Thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, I'm looking for questions. So if anyone has questions, please pop them in the in the chat. Um, a question that I have, you know, um, you have a very warm way about you, but I know as a leader that there are times where there has to be some conflict that you have to manage or um, behavior issues, the, 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 the tough nuts and bolts of leadership. It isn't always going to go smoothly. Can you share, um, you know, with conflict or with some of those types of leadership challenges, what are some of the, skills that you uh, use to try to um, get resolution in a, in a challenging, um, for example, an HR issue or a, a, an issue with one of your stakeholders? Yeah, um, I, I think it is absolutely just get down to business, right? Just focus on what the challenge is and what the um, behavior is that needs to be corrected um, and get to it immediately. Uh, we mentioned that um, early on about respecting others and, and really um, getting, don't expecting something to fix itself, right? It's also really easy if you're uh, fortunate enough to have an HR department, it's really easy as a leader to just, you know, let HR worry about that. But, you know, sometimes they're not the best person to be dealing with that. And if you're a leader, you kind of, you want to get to those situations before it gets to HR, right? The idea is uh, we want to coach people up right? We, we want to empower them. We don't want to have those gotcha moments. We, we don't want somebody to be surprised that their, um, their productivity or their behavior is a challenge. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. We terminated a handful of people this year. Um, you have to have expectations and you have to hold people accountable, but that only works if you're doing it for yourself as well, right? So when you set an expectation for yourself, you have to hold yourself accountable to those same things. And depending on where you are in your organization's leadership structure, um, I find that as a challenge in my role because I report to a board of directors who I only see twice a month, right? Now I'm, I'm connecting with them more than that, um, but it makes it even harder for me um, and puts more onus on me as a good leader that I'm holding myself accountable to my own expectations that the organization has for me. Um, now, 
what I would say, um, and I can't remember the name of the movie. It was the, the it might have been Moneyball, um, where uh, Brad Pitt is telling, uh, um, oh gosh, I'm thinking, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but anyway, he's saying like, look, we're gonna trade this guy. Just bring him in. Tell him we're trading him. This is who you need to talk to. And move on. I really do feel that that's a, uh, an effective strategy when you're trying to correct behaviors um, and make some changes that are, are a little more difficult is let's not let's not dilly dally let's focus this is what the problem is um and document it right i cannot stress enough document what you're working on what the the action plan is and how we're going to move from there um but also stressing that it's not the person you're attacking it is the behavior that just needs to be improved right so it's um it's hard to separate those um especially when someone is being brought in for a coaching session that's not going so well, it's hard to take that emotional piece out of it. Um, but I, I personally find it's effective if you reinforce that um, that person is valuable, right? It's not the person that is the challenge, it's the behaviors that the person is, is uh, exemplifying. Um, and really finishing that meeting with how you value the person. Um, I think that's important, even in those times uh, where maybe that conversation is ending in a termination, um, is reinforcing that you appreciate the person, you appreciate working with them, you know um, that they have value, um, but but this isn't maybe the right chair for their skill sets. And it goes back to something um, else from an HR perspective, Sheila, that I really believe in, and that is making sure you have the right people in the right chairs. Yeah. It's another one of those um, items that we hear about a lot and um, and it is absolutely critical because I'm going to tell you right now, in about the first 30 to 60 days, you're going to know whether or not you had the right person in the right chair. And those are those mistakes as a leader that you have to own too, right? Because that can become a challenging conversation if you have a probationary period with a new employer or a, no, a new employee is, is having that tough conversation of saying, you know what? We really like you, but this isn't quite working out. The skill sets aren't there or identifying how can we coach this person up and get them the skill sets they need to be successful? Depends on the conversation, but uh, man, a, as a leader in an organization, uh, you're going to spend so much more time fixing uh, that miss when you put somebody in the wrong chair. Um, and sometimes they're just a great person, but you thought you had them, but but it was not quite the right fit. But it might be the right fit in a different chair in your organization. So being open to that flexibility too. That's a that's a great leadership lesson. Um, a bad hire is a tough problem to solve, and it will constantly be, be a burr in your saddle until you figure out what chair they belong in. There's a couple of questions in the chat that are about um, 2020, and I, I, I'd like to read two of them. What is the hardest situation you had to deal with in 2020? How did you handle it, and what did you learn from it? And then there's a, a question that um, kind of expands on that. What are some new leadership behaviors you, you found yourself using during this COVID pandemic? that pleasantly surprised you and will continue to be part of your leadership toolbox going forward? So I have a, a unique experience, especially going into 2020. So as Sheila mentioned, um, I was hired in November of 2019. I had just enough time to learn our business before everything hit the fan. <laughs> um, the other unique position that I found myself in is I have never been in this chair before. So I've I've held leadership positions in organizations, but I've never been the CEO of the organization. So I was also still having to learn how to do my job. Um, and one of the things that um, I wanted to implement uh, with my team in my leadership team, um, we have weekly meetings. Uh, it's our Wednesday leadership meeting. Um, and one thing that I wanted to make sure everybody understood is I did not want a team of uh, leaders reporting to me, just shaking their head yes and going with what I was saying. Um, so I expect in my meetings, I expect there to be conflict. That doesn't mean um, arguments. I expect there to be conflict. I want my team to speak their mind and share what they think might be a barrier or a challenge to implementing a new strategy to what we're currently doing, what should we be doing different? Um, otherwise it's a waste of time. Um, so I really, um, really felt that early in our meetings um, as my team was starting to get to know me and I was getting to know them, that was 
um, something we had to work towards. And I had to continually um, reaffirm that I expect us to not all agree. But at the end of the meeting, once we've made a decision, we're all on the same page and we're leaving that room and showing the team that we're, we have a consensus. Um, so that was one of those pieces of leadership that, um, that I felt growing into it. And we, we implement, so uh, yesterday, Wednesday is our team meeting for, for my leadership team. Um, we've got a new program we're launching and we had to have a conversation on how are we going to do this? What is it going to look like? How are we going to fund it? Um, and that took a, a good, you know, maybe 20, 30 percent of our meeting because we had to have some really hard conversations on how we're going to do that. Um, so I would encourage you to identify um, what is a strategy you want to work on. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to lie. Like, look, there, don't recreate the wheel. I came up with that just by reading Death by Meeting because we've all sat in terrible meetings. And Death by Meeting is a great book that shows you, like, this is why you have terrible meetings. Don't do those things. Um, so that was just one of those strategies that I implemented and we've continued to implement and will continue to do. Now, what I'll, I will say in terms of uh, leadership um, in COVID and what is going to come out of COVID, I don't know that there's really any changes in leadership. What I think though is effective leaders had ha have had to remind themselves how important these values-based principles and relationships are. Right, so it's really easy to find yourself um, caught up in sitting behind your desk um, because part of my job is making sure the doors are open and the lights are on. But I can't forget those simple pieces of that, you know, management by walking around and spending that time. So it's not necessarily that there's new things to do. It's just remembering how important um, your staff feels that you value them, and that only happens by building that relationship with them individually. Um, so I would say that that would be the most critical thing. Now, the other thing I would say with our community is we have heard a lot of rhetoric about how we are uh, more divided now than we've ever been. And I don't know that that's true. I think our country has been this divided for a very, very long time. However, and that's when you're looking at it from a macro perspective. If you're talking about your local relationships and what our community is doing, I don't know that we have been more united than we have during COVID. Sure, there's things here and there that we may disagree on, but for the most part, and I can say this from a food bank perspective, we have never seen the community rally behind what the needs of our community are like we did in 2020. People care. That's all there is to it, is identify where that middle ground is because if you're on the left or you're on the right, it, it really doesn't matter. We can all agree food is a problem, right? Now, how we tackle that problem is gonna differ based on what your principles are and where you put your, value ba your values. Um, but we can all agree on this. And I think that's something that can be implemented no matter what your organization is focused on. You can find what that middle ground and consensus is. Um, and I do believe that our community will rally behind you as well as your team. We've had a lot of good comments in the in the chat. Uh, Cindy, thanks for reminding us about Brene Brown and rumbling with vulnerability, which is what Victor was describing in those meetings with his team, his leadership team, you know, solving the issues, hashing through it, even if they're challenging conversations, and then going forward to the team and being on the same page. So uh, thank you for thank you for that. Uh, there's also uh, Andreas has a really good question about um, uh, you know, do you have a personal strategic plan, uh, Victor, that implements you know your strategies on implementing the seven values that you talked about and um that you hold really crucial and then the second part of that question because you this is your first year as the the ceo of a of a uh, organization um what have you learned about yourself in 2020 uh probably it, you know you talked about the different hats that you wear you know you're you manage leadership in a lot of different domains you're you know you're a family man so you've got leadership in your home life with your children and you, your family and then uh, leadership with this community service that you do through the school board and then of course the um the job you carry which is you know, in the nonprofit sector and really is a lot about, um, you know, servant based leadership, just in the fact that you're taking care of so many people on your team and then your stakeholders and then the community at large. So uh, wh what about your strategic plan? And then what did you learn about yourself in 2020? Yeah, so um, with a personal strategic plan, I'll be honest with you, I have not 
formally written something down, but I can tell you what guides me. Um, the reason I do the work I do, I've been working in nonprofit for over 10 years. Um, prior to that, I was in the financial services industry. Um, I grew up in Northwest Indiana. I went away for school. I came back to Northwest Indiana. I love the region. I think this is a great place. This is what drives me. One is my goal is to make Northwest Indiana a better place tomorrow than it was today. And by focusing on that, it's really easy to focus how I'm spending my time today. Because if I'm spending my time playing video games on my phone, I'm not making Northwest Indiana a better place tomorrow. Okay. Um, so it's, it, it kind of adds to, you know, how do I focus how I do my work, right? Two is in order to do that, I have to affect meaningful, transformational, and generational change. So how do I do that? Um, and that's where I find the um, personal satisfaction in the work I do in my career. But those same things guide my efforts on my, um, on my school board and political life, right? I'm not looking for some sort of accolade. I honestly want my school board, my schools to be better tomorrow than they were today. So it's just taking those personal values and implementing them in my day-to-day -day work. Now, we're not perfect, right? So I'm not going to lie to you and say that I'm able to do that every day. I'm not. But I can tell you one thing. So um, I, I've, I've learned um, through my travels um, that it's really easy to focus on taking a 24-hour day and divide it into three parts. So you have eight hours for your normal work. You have eight hours for refreshment and rest. And then you have eight hours in service to your community. And if you take that lesson and implement it into your, your day, you can really have some meaningful impact in your community. Um, now, again, I'm not going to lie to you and say I spend eight hours at work, eight hours sleeping, and then eight hours just doing community service. But if you just use that as a guide, um, that is a great loose strategic plan for how to, how to have a really... Um, rewarding and impactful life. So that is what I would say in terms of my personal plan. Uh, for two, um, what did I learn about myself? I learned one thing. Early on, my one of my board members said, um, I have a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, with her um, every two months. And this is something that keeps coming up and I don't have an answer for it. Um, it's one of my downfalls. What am I doing that is leading versus doing? And I struggle with that. It's really easy for me to just go do instead of lead. Um, and I need to get better about that. Um, I'm still learning how to do that. Um, and I think that's one of my challenges being new to a, a CEO role is learning more on how to be hands off. Um, even though I mentioned that in my values, it doesn't mean I'm perfect at doing it, right? I still need to get better at that but I know that about myself. The other thing I learned about myself that I had no idea until somebody told me this, uh, again, response from my board, I move fast. Um, so once, uh, once my team makes a decision, we're acting on it. I, I don't, I don't want to sit around and, and, and relitigate a decision we've made. We're, we've made the decision. We're moving on it. Let's go. Um, that can be a good and a bad thing. So we launched in 2020, one, two, three, four, five, six, off the top of my head, seven new programs that we have never done before. Um, <laughs> and coming on board is one of those new programs that we're launching in 2021. And yesterday we're, we decided on launching another new program. Once I make a decision, we're moving fast. Now the challenge of moving fast is it's really easy to drop a plate. Um, so I often am telling my team because we're so lean, uh, we have a lot of plates that we're spinning in the air, right? So we need to keep track of which of those plates are the fine china passed down from great grandma and which of those plates are the china that we got at Meyer. Um, we're going to drop one. We're, there's just no way around it. We're moving too fast. Um, but we really have to focus on those plates that we can't drop and those plates that uh, we drop, but we're going to have to apologize and it's not going to hurt so bad. Um, that doesn't make it okay, but that's just how we're living in, uh, in how we respond to COVID. Um, I'm not sure if I answered those questions, um, but those are the best I can give you right now, Andres. 
I, I think that your answers are practical and great. And I might have to use that China versus China analogy in my own explanation of things to uh, some of the some of the um, the people that we we talk to regularly. Uh, you know, I think your your uh, what I'm reading in the chat, people are really impressed with your passion and your vision. And you know, if you haven't had time face to face with Victor, he's not just like this for the hour that we're spending. This is Victor's Victor's. Karma. This is his. Uh, he's he's got a uh, you know a really warm style. And what you focused on in some of those last comments is that you know you're not just a leader at work. You're a leader in all the domains of your life. So you're a leader in the community. You're a leader in, in your home and, and neighborhood life and your family life. And you're also a leader um, in the workplace. And how do you merge those? How do you allow yourself time to make mistakes? And I really appreciate your humility, Victor, in saying like I'm not. I've got this as a goal and I work on it, but sometimes I don't, I'm not able to do it all or I forget or I, and, you know, I have to remind myself. So I, I think to Andreas's point about like that strategic plan, even if to have strategic principles that you continue to um, play over and over in your, in your head or write down in your journal and, and revisit them, I think that's a really, um, really good leadership tool. Uh, Andreas, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just wanted to tell you, and I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. I'm, I'm just trying to figure it out sometimes when you come up with a set of values that you, you want to live by uh, in your leadership, in your home, uh, all aspects of leadership, it's really what I was trying to get at is how do you really implement them without feeling overwhelmed by this weight of, okay, here I have these very you know, important values that I want to be part of my life and I want to impart to the team that I work with how, how do you balance that aspect of like, okay, there are important things, but where, how, where do I start with the implementation? What is a, a value that I, I hold more dear than others? Or what is a priority in the organization I'm working with? Is kindness a more important value than humility? Or what, I, I'm just picking an example. Yeah, I, so I, I love this. I absolutely love this question. And it's, it's another cliche answer, right? Um, it's why my answer to the original question was make Northwest Indiana a better place tomorrow than it was today, because that allows me to take a bite out of that issue, right? Because the enormity of that is too large. But if I can make a change in one person's life, even minutely tomorrow, then I am following that, that personal um, plan and value system. Now, when you're talking about how you put more emphasis on I guess uh, if we're talking about these seven principles on where do we focus the time, I don't think you can. And I think that's something that um, you learn as well as a leader on uh, where do you improve yourself as, as you're looking at that lifelong um, learning. You know, there might be areas in these seven principles that you need to be better at, right? So focusing on that and a little bit more time on that, if you're going to use this as a model on how you lead. Um, and then there's going to be those areas that you're just naturally better at. And, and I, I can tell you that that is absolutely a, a part of my life is trying to figure out what of these things do I need to do better because I just naturally do these other things. Um, now, whether you're writing that down or not, um, I'm not sure. But, um, but I think getting down to um, knowing your strengths and weaknesses is, is absolutely critical. Um, I lost my train of thought. There was something else I wanted to follow on there. Um, and I know that we're getting really close on time. So um, before I kick back to Sheila, and I apologize, Andres, because I am no, I am doing no service to your actual question. Um, but I, I can only tell you that, that, um, that this is what I can offer to all of you. I, I said, I believe good leaders build good leaders. Um, so I, I challenged you to, to learn from others. Um, and, and that is my call to action for each of you. However, my um, expectation of myself is that I hold myself to those values I've already said. So I, I leave you with this. If you need someone to talk to or have uh, a question or you just wanna dig a little deeper, shoot me an email, give me a call. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk to you and help out in any way I can. If there's a challenge you're seeing and, and you, know, you just wanna bounce it off someone else, that's how you learn, right? Is by leveraging the network of people that you have. So please consider me as part of your network um, and, and reach out to me. Um, and that doesn't need to be programmatic, doesn't need to be food bank. It doesn't mean, hey, how do I volunteer? 
if you've got a challenge, just, just reach out. I, I will be happy to spend time with you. Um, there was another thing. See, so, see Victor, I, I get on a soapbox and I'm going to keep job. going. So we, we, we need to make this like a two hour session. Uh, okay. Victor's done a fabulous job and he just showed you something that leaders do really well. Leaders are willing to help. So you and your leadership should be opening your, your heart to others who might need help, as he just did to us. And he said, you know, just shoot me an email, call me, text me. I, I'm happy to, uh, to offer you what wisdom I may have or any tips that I may have. So that's really, really helpful. Victor, thank you so very much. We uh, are really grateful that you've spent your lunch with, with everyone seems to have loved it. It was practical, it was gritty, it was cheerful and uh, inspiring. And I, I, uh, I thank you again from all of us and, and from the Leadership Institute at Purdue Northwest. So thank you so much, Victor. And thank you everyone, we'll see you soon. Thanks everybody. Bye.